let's now look at the full wave functions for the hydrogen atom. So we had our Hamiltonian h psi equals e psi. The psi is a function of three variables in spherical polar coordinates. r, the distance from an electron to a proton, which is fixed at the origin. So these are the wave functions of the electron. The proton is just fixed at the origin because it's so much uh, heavier, so much more massive. There's a polar angle from the z-axis theta and an azimuthal angle in the xy plane of phi. And these, these wave functions have three quantum numbers, n, l, and m, and they, this can be separated into a function of r and a function of theta and phi. We have this r, which depends on the quantum numbers n and l, and gives us this function down here. And we have the ylm, which are the spherical harmonics, uh, functions of the angles theta and phi which give us this these spherical harmonics down here and these spherical harmonics were again the wave functions for the rigid rotor because that's a system where you had no potential energy in the angular coordinates theta and phi of spherical polar uh, a spherical polar system so these are the same wave functions that we looked at for the rigid rotor system and we'll see very clear analogies to the angular momentum uh, operators and the angular, angular momentum component in the z direction. And for the uh, radial part, we just looked at plots of those, those wave function plots, and those depend on uh, both, what the, uh, both what the quantum number n and what the quantum number l are equal to. So when you substitute all of this uh, gigantic mess together with each other, what do you end up getting? Well, what I've got down here are color-coded for psi of n, l, m, and m is also m sub l, m and m sub l. You might hear either one of those terms. They're the same thing. And the part which is just a normalization constant is the part that I have in green. The part that depends on um, the radial part or the quantum number uh, n I have here in purple. That's the, the radial part of the wave function that we had looked at previously. Then for the part that depends on theta, the polar angle, the angle away from the z-axis, I have in yellow in all of these terms here. And then lastly, m, the part that depends on the azimuthal angle phi, the angle in the xy plane. And the quantum number m, I have that part uh, listed are drawn here in this uh, cyan type color. Okay, so if we go through these, as we see for psi 100, that's just an exponential which starts at some value at r equals zero and decays away, and there's no angular part, so that is pretty much the same as we saw for um, the radial plots of this. And as I said, this is actually the 1s orbital. And then uh, that's the only wave function for n equals 1. Then for n equals 2, we can have the values uh, l equals 0 and m equals 0. That gives us a function which has one radial node, one part where the radial wave function equals 0, uh, before infinity, that is. And this is actually the 2s orbital. This one here, there's two regions of density, one close in and one further out from the nucleus. We have the L equals 1, or N equals 2, L equals 1, M equals 0 state, where we have some cosine theta. We have some uh, dependence on this polar angle phi. This is actually the 2pz orbital. So the dumbbell-shaped 2p orbital, we'll look at those in the, in the next video. But this is the exact 2pz orbital. Then when we start including non-zero values of m, because m can go all the way up to l and minus l, we have plus or minus 1, and that equals that same angular part, but now times sine theta and this complex exponential e to the plus or minus i phi. And each of these are not exactly the px and py orbitals that we're familiar with because um, they're complex. They have this imaginary part in here and usually chemists we want to deal with numbers which are real and functions that are real so what we actually do to get the 2px and the 2py orbital is we take advantage of Euler's identity that e to the 
plus or minus i m phi is going to equal cosine m phi plus or minus, same plus or minus, i times sine m phi. Then you can solve for cosine and sine by saying that cosine m phi equals one half of e to the i m phi plus e to the minus i m phi. And similarly, sine of m phi you can find is one over two i e to the i m phi minus e to the minus i m phi. So to get our actual 2px and 2pz orbitals, what we'll do is something like this. Um, we'll have 2px equals 1 over root 2 for the normalization constant, psi 2, 1, plus 1, plus psi 2, 1, minus 1. And then in the same vein, we'll have 2py is going to equal 1 over i squared to 2, psi 2, 1 plus 1 minus psi 2, 1 minus 1. And what's that, what that is actually going to do is it's going to turn this complex part here into either cosine phi for 2px or sine phi for 2py. So when we uh, display these actual atomic orbitals and what their shapes look like, that's how we get from things like this complex uh, form here in order to having them all be completely real. As you saw these three, the, the first three we looked at were all completely real. So that's how we get from a complex form to a real form. So there's going to be some issues with that that we'll have to look at in terms of operators and eigenvalues later. But for now, uh, I just wanted to show kind of the idea of how we get to real orbitals and get to this cosine and phi and sine phi form. And there's going to be similar tricks you can play with these as we get to those uh, down the line there. Then we, <clears throat> those are all the n equals 2 states. At n equals 3, we have what's going to be the 3s orbital with a uh, quadratic polynomial in rho, which rho is just the just ZR over the Bohr radius. Z is the number of protons in the nucleus. As we said previously, we have this in here because this is these are valid wave functions for any uh, atom or ion which only has one electron. So this would be hydrogen or helium plus, lithium two plus, beryllium three plus, etc. And the Bohr radius just being uh, 0.529 angstroms, angstrom being 10 to the minus 10th meters. Then we have uh, n equals 3, l equals 1, uh, m equals 0, which is going to be the 3pz orbital. And for the 3p orbitals, we're going to have that radial node that uh, p orbitals have being kind of this dumbbell shape. But it's also, or sorry, it's going to have an angular node for that dumbbell shape, but it also has a radial node. There's a part where the radial wave function is going to equal zero before it reaches infinity. And it has this same angular dependence as the, as the 2pz orbital does. And we have um, for 3, n equals 3, l equals 1, uh, m equaling plus and minus 1, uh, those, again, you take linear combinations of those like like so below and we get the 3px and the 3py orbitals from those two. Then the next one uh, 320 l equals 2 this is where we start to get the d orbitals at l equals 2 which would be this would be the 3 d z squared orbital and that has a similar decaying exponential form, but has a Legendre polynomial or associated Legendre function, which is, which is quadratic here, which you get from this uh, 
part of the spherical harmonics there. So that's where you start getting the d orbitals from is when you're getting becoming uh, quadratic in your Legendre polynomials here. Uh, then the rest of these are all just the rest of the z the uh, 3d orbitals. Not a, not entirely sure off top, the top of my head which ones are which in terms of uh, 3d xy xz yz and x squared minus y squared but those are the rest of the 3d orbitals which have some uh, slightly different shape than the 3d z squared orbitals okay so that's kind of the basic intro to uh, what the full glorious functional form of all of these wave functions look like for the uh, n equals 1 to n equals 3 states as you can see this is very quickly going to get unwieldy and yield a lot of terms but I just wanted to show that the you have this type of breakdown and see where each of these parts are coming from so when you look up these very long values for what these b are in a table or a formula sheet that you just see it's just a normalization constant times a function of radius times a function of the azimuthal angle times a function of the polar angle theta times a function of the azimuth uh, phi and these all come from these various different parts of the wave function that we originally get out of the Schrodinger equation.